<clears throat> right, so I'll start with a bit of introductory stuff um, to motivate it. So if you take the example of social norms, okay, so a social norm emerges partly, or partly emerges, as a result of all the beliefs, the identity, the actions of all the individuals that are involved in it. Yeah. So um, if you're walking down a corridor and everyone's going on the left-hand side or something like that, it may become a norm. But of course, at the same time, the same norm is constraining and influencing all those actions, beliefs of those individuals. Okay. In fact, what we call a social norm is in fact some sort of label we stick on this complex interaction, this lock-in that we observe in society, which involves both uh, the emergence from the individuals and what's sometimes called emergence, which is the opposite way downwards, all at the same time. Okay? And things are changing and it's a whole complex and we label it as a social norm. <clears throat> so at the, at the core of social norms, as well as lots of other social phenomena, this macro-micro relationship, the relationship between what's happening in society, what's happening in individuals, is at its core, okay? And basically, agent-based simulation allows you to represent that complex and explore some of the possible possibilities within that. <clears throat> okay, so nice picture, next picture, uh, now becoming heavily overused. So you might have uh, societal level things which are often measured uh, extensively by social scientists um, in censuses and surveys and time series and stuff like that. And of course, we also have knowledge of how individuals behave, or at least some knowledge, although that's fairly weak. Um, so it could be narrative knowledge or narrative accounts, qualitative accounts rather than um, precise accounts. And at social science generally concentrates on all of these theories that can connect these two very often, okay? What simulation does is it allows you to make precise stories that connect these two. Now, of course, you might not get the precise story. There may be lots of possible precise stories between these two, and you might miss the ones that are actually applicable in, in, in the case you're thinking about, but it can generate a lot of these precise stories. So that's one way of thinking about it. Um, some key historical figures. Uh, Herbert Simon is one of my sort of heroes uh, because he did two things. He not only observed behaviour, so instead of taking a priori theoretical account that was common at the time of rationality, he actually sat down and observed people and saw what they did. And he noticed that people used what he called a procedural rationality. That is, they have a sort of algorithm. They do this, and they try this, and if that doesn't work, they do that. And if everything else fails, they go up and talk to their friend. And if that fails, and they're really desperate, they talk to the boss. Whatever the hell it is. They have, they have a set of procedures which dominate a lot of what they do. Okay? Um, and that was contrasted with what he called uh, substantive rationality. Okay? Which was basically a sort of uh, utility account. So not only did he sort of do some actual observations of people and describe them in sort of algorithmic terms, but he did a second thing. He also produced some of the first computational models of cognition, how people solve problems, little puzzles and chess problems and stuff like that in a, in a computer. So he started modeling how people sort of deal with information and, and behave in very simple, he, he did this in very simple circumstances. And these two streams, in a sense, have now come back together with agent-based social simulation, although he didn't have the tools to bring that back together. In fact, his later work, he tended to regress a bit to try and do some formal modelings with some not-so-good ideas, I thought. So we, we have uh, satisfa satisfying and spicy, sorry, satisfy and some of his mathematical models, which generally weren't so good as these two key developments. Thomas Schelling showed a very simple, dramatic example of individual-based modelling, but I'll show that in a moment. Granovater did two things. He, he, he distinguished the importance of social embedding, 
So he's arguing against oversimplifying social interaction, both against economists who'd like to see, uh, in a sense, the individual disappear into prototypical economic actors, but also against uh, over-socialized model, which just assume that people express society and they don't really have any other role in it. Okay, but he also gave some dramatic examples: the strength of strength of weak ties and things like that, which are sort of made for an agent-based social simulation approach. They have that sort of mindset. Okay. So those are three like that. Now. It's really a mixture of various different fields. So big impact from social sciences, an impact from various computer programming languages. Uh, in fact, the first object-oriented language, Simula, was vaguely conceived of as a sort of social simulation language. So there were these objects that had rules and were communicated with other objects by people. So it had a very early influence in the design of computer languages. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, obviously they're producing human-like or human-ish algorithms. Ecological modeling. All of these strands have sort of come together eventually in this technique. Strangely, these have not really had much influence. Economics has had not much influence. Uh, partly because they are, were obsessed, are obsessed by analytical approaches and partly because they have a very strong, to put it politely, tr tradition of how they think of people. Um, but cognitive modelers, you'd expect them to be well involved. But no, they concentrate on individuals, single people. They don't really see the social side. Numerical simulation has gone its own way. It tends to be looks at things on top-down basis, uh, very connected to analytical approaches. System dynamics. They're thinking about some of these issues, but they prefer a top-down approach. So strangely, not so much from those. OK, so let's talk about a bit what it is. But I'm going to start with what it isn't. So an analytical model is something like a mathematical formula. And the important thing about that, it's a precise model. It doesn't have to be mathematics. It can be logic. It can be uh, graphical. It can be all sorts of things. But it's generally maths. Uh, and the important thing in this is you can actually derive, you can prove the form of the results. Okay? Um, but the difficulty with this is only fairly simple models can be treated analytically. You can only prove things with pretty simple models. Even the best physicists and mathematicians have to simplify greatly in order to do this. Okay? And the rest, they really use them like a sort of computer program. They calculate things using them which is not analytic. Now, in the days when the only formal models were analytical models, you can understand why people maybe tried to use analytical models for social phenomena. Um, and in a sense, analytical models still have this scientific cachet. They're associated with science. It's nothing to do with fundamentally what science is about, which is explaining what's out there in meaningful ways. But it's just the, what the tradition is. Good science has maths in it. Okay? Um, of course, mathematicians don't believe that, but physicists do. Okay? So that's analytical models. So what generally happens, if we, um, this is a fairly simple analogy here. If we have an observed world where something's happening and there are some outcomes, if we're building an equation-based model we have to somehow abstract into a sequence of equations which are relating factors describing all of these. And that leads to outcomes from your equations. The, and then you check it by checking the aggregated outcomes on both levels, basically. The, one of the difficulties with this is the difficulty of this step. It takes a huge amount of skill to formulate a thing that captures some of those in a very good way. Very difficult to do. And the second weakness is there's, it's only weakly checked upon the aggregate outcomes. You don't really check it in the detail. Okay. A computational model is a formal model because it's a precise thing 
in a computer, a computer program. So the same program roughly produces the same results, although they may have some random bits built into it. Um, it can be very simple or complex, but basically you have a program and you run it. Now, it doesn't have to be numerical. Okay, so let's, let's, so if we've got a, a computer-based simulation, oh, sorry, talk, to finish this slide first. Um, I had another slide, actually, but must be one coming up, up. Okay. So it doesn't have to be numerical. In fact, some of the AI languages are to do with structures, interacting with other structures, and numbers doesn't really come into it. You can use numbers if you like, but you don't have to. Okay? So, it, in a sense, it's a more general um, field of possibilities than just sort of the sort of mathematics you'll be familiar with. So, now going a bit more specific to individual-based simulation, what is that? Well, you still you have the same world with same outcomes, but instead of doing a clever step, you represent each person by a separate chunk in the program. So it's a fairly simplistic representation, a fairly natural and simplistic representation. Um, to the extent that when people are talking about them, they often confuse both sides and call these people and stuff like that. Okay. So you do have to simplify, but you don't simplify as much as you do on the equation-based system. Now, one of the advantages of this technique is that you don't only have to compare the results on the aggregate level, but you can compare the details of the outcomes as well. See whether these bits are doing anything that you recognise as similar to that bit at all. Whether it's doing something completely different. You don't only have to look at the aggregate levels. And this has relevance because it, it allows qualitative narrative accounts to be put in as evidence to such simulations as well as numerical ones. Now... That's individual-based simulation because you're keeping track of the individuals. If the individuals are fairly empty, they just generally call the individual base. But if you put a lot of sort of cognitive machinery or processes in there that you could interpret as being human cognition, some aspect of human cognition, then it's called agent-based simulation. Okay? Because you're extending this analogy with people. They have agency in some very weak sense, weak, weak, weak sense that agent-based modelers argue about. What's the meaning of this agency? Okay. Um, so that, that's what agent-based modeling is. When, from my interpretation, the process is happening inside one of these bits of the model can be interpreted as a sort of cognition in some weak sense. Okay, so that's what it means. So, all the characteristics of this agent-based modeling, so it's a computational description, it's got lots of bits, it's almost never an analytically tractable. Um, it tends to be much more specific, because of that mapping is fairly obvious, it tends to be much more specific to a particular situation, rather than generic. And the assumptions it makes are much less drastic than the equation-based ones. So, for example, in a lot of economic models, you have to assume various things about rationality in order to be able to get any, have any chance of getting a proof out or make very strong assumptions like um, all the agents know the correct model of the economy or something like that. Okay? Here, you don't have to do that. You can have much more contingent, messy processes happening in, in there, more human-like processes. Okay? And you have all this detail of these unfolding processes accessible. So you run it, and you can stop it and see every step, what's happening to every bit of the simulation as it goes along. So in a sense, and you could then try it again. So it's got a huge advantage that you can store and inspect all of these things. It's like being uh, the ideal social s researcher. You know, you've got all these people trapped in this box, and you can watch them and follow them around and talk to them and see what they're thinking and stuff like that. So you could used to in explore inheritance possibilities. I'll talk a little bit about that. Often validated in, in a lot of different ways. It's quite difficult to validate these models, but I will talk a bit more about that. And often the models themselves are so complex we don't fully understand the models. 
even nice checked models in nature. Okay, so here's a picture. So what happens? What do you actually do? You roughly decide what sort of things you want in the simulation. Some of these could appear later on. So these might be parents, and you might have another one that's born later, etc., like that. But basically you decide, okay, there are people, and maybe there's affirms, and maybe there are norms, and maybe there are these kind of messages, and maybe make some sort of decision about that. You then program each of these dots, in a sense, or those dots, with a set of rules. So you give them each sets of rules. And these rules are usually at the form something like, if this has happened, and this has happened, then you do this. If you got to the end of the day and you haven't finished your list of tasks, then you do so and so and so and so. If your friend tells you uh, they found this really good thing on eBay and you wanted a particular item, you go to the website. Okay. When you run it, what happens is that simultaneously all of these set sets of rules are evaluated to see what was happened. And all the rules are checked to see whether they should they apply. And if they apply, you then do the action bit, the do bit. And it's all done simultaneously. So you get this unfolding of the processes as all these agents interact. We'll have some examples of this in a bit. Okay? And that's the simulation run. This sort of trace of all of these interactions and what happened as these, the effect of these rules unfold in parallel. So if you imagine, uh, you know, two people playing chess, and instead of playing chess, they've written down all the rules of how to, they want to play chess and when they want to move the rook and everything, and then they just can those in and fed into two computers, and two computers just play the game of chess. Okay. Now, one step that's often not, not talked about is the outcomes are then represented somehow. So they're inspected, they're put in graphs, they're pictured, they're measured, they're interpreted in different ways. Okay. So in some sense, the input to the simulation is the specification, and the output are the representation of our outcomes. And the inference is this running of the program in the simulation. So here's an example, famous example, 1971, um, a model of uh, racial segregation that Thomas Schelling made. Okay. Now, let's ignore in the cultural context of America in 1971 for the moment, okay? <laughs> let's just look at what the simulation is to start with. It's a very simple simulation. There are black dots and white dots on a grid. Each dot has the following rule. Each iteration, each click, every dot looks at all its neighbours. So this net one looks at all those seven neighbours. If less than 30% of the same colour as itself, it moves somewhere randomly. Okay, and that's it. So if it's got 35% the same colour, but mostly the opposite colour, it's still happy. It sits there. So what happens? You put the dots at random to start with. For those that are really interested, this is sort of wrapped. So this edge joins up to this edge, and this edge joins up to this edge. For some reason, I, I, I chose to do it like that. I don't know why. OK? So after what this is iteration naught, after one click, some of them are moved. Now, this one is obviously unhappy, because all its neighbors are the opposite color itself. According to this rule, it'll move out. Ooh. Well, maybe it chose the wrong place because it's equally unhappy there. And uh, this keeps on happening. And quite soon, uh, as long as there's enough empty spaces, you get to a stage where nothing more is going to change. Everyone's got to a happy, and these, this, the, none of these rules are going to be applicable to any of the dots. Okay. Now, what's happened? You see these blobs, these segregated patches, have emerged of these different types. Um, and Schelling's conclusion was segregation can result from a very weak pressure 
from a very weak prejudice. It doesn't have to be a strong prejudice, it can be a weak prejudice, and segregation will still emerge. Okay? In a sense, he was saying, look, everyone assumes that because we see segregation around, that it must be the result of a strong pressure of racial intolerance. But he was saying, look, that, that isn't necessarily the case. It can be a result from a very weak pressure. So in a sense, he was using this model as a counterexample. Okay. He, he actually didn't have a computer. He had a checkerboard uh, floor in his kitchen, and he used plates. So he used plates upside down and the right way up. And he did these first computations by turning over the plates and moving the plates on his kitchen floor. Okay, so <laughs> um, uh, that, that must be fun to look at. Okay, so here's all the elements of a... Um, an agent-based social simulation, although an extremely simple one. Each dot has its sort of behavioural rule, <laughs> so you can imagine it looking around in its neighbour, deciding what to do, and then maybe acting or not. And the, the result, you can see uh, the result. Now, this is highly suggestive, this simulation. Okay, So just watching that process, you can interpret it in your mind in a way that you can't from the proof of an analytical equation. Ah, oh, therefore, the output is the dysfunctional form, you know. That's good and that's bad, okay? Um, it's highly suggested because it's highly interpretable. So one of the advantages of this kind of technique is it means that non-experts can often criticise it. They can say, no, 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 you wouldn't, you wouldn't move randomly. No one's that stupid. And they can criticise your model, okay? But on the on, on, on the negative side, it's more convincing than it should be. Okay, Because you can do this natural interpretation for it, it's, it's somehow more persuasive. And modelers fall prey to this. Once you play with this a long time, rather than just watch it, you play with your model, you program it, you play with it, it becomes more and more convincing and you go outside and you see the whole world in terms of your model for three days before you're deprogrammed. <laughs> um, and it may well not be directly related to any observations, any direct observations at all. So people have tried to uh, apply shelling type models to actual patterns of residence in cities, and it's very difficult to do. It doesn't really work. And however you sort of fix the data, it doesn't really work. Okay. Um, I Schelling claimed that he was using it just as a counterexample. So he was strictly true. But of course, the impact of what he said in the culture of what he said went far beyond that. Um, the impact. So what was happening here, really? You had the computational model, this little computer program. You had the thing you were thinking about. But what you were really modelling was not the city itself. You're modelling your ideas about what happens in the city. This concept. So really, this conceptual model is what you're exploring with this simulation. And the only connection with the, with the phenomena itself is some sort of analogy from this idea to what you're thinking about. So this model doesn't have any direct connection to the phenomena. It has an indirect connection. And of course, because People are really skilled at applying analogies. Well, those that aren't uh, too far down the Asperger's sy syndrome, anyway. Okay, um, they are very they, they they do analogies almost unconsciously. So one of the things about that is people aren't aware of the full details of the mapping of how they apply an analogy. You can sort of everyone works with an analogy, but you ask say. How does that analogy apply? And they haven't necessarily thought about it. So that makes the, the link between here and here in formal terms much weaker. And that's what often happens. So you, if you read some books about um, social simulation, like uh, Epstein and Ax, Ax, Axel, Axtel, Growing Artificial Societies, or the, all this evolution of cooperation stuff, that's what's happening. It's not really directly modeling anything we observe at all. Okay, it's talking about ideas. How could cooperation have evolved? Okay, not how it did. 
Okay, so let's look at how you might judge a model. How am I doing? Oh, okay. Any model, natural language, any model at all, there's a lot of competing pools on what you want out of this model. You want it to be designed right with your knowledge of how it works, maybe with respect to your tradition in a field that you have to publish. You want it to have lack of error in the results. You want it to be simple enough that you can actually deal with it and check it and write it down. You would like it to be quite general, not just to hold for that specific case, but maybe a few other cases, etc. Okay. Sometimes I draw this as a modeling trade-off as sort of points on, on, on a, on a uh, what's the shape called? Pyramid. What? Tetrahedron or something, isn't it? I don't know. Okay. So you would like all these things. You'd like them to be simple. You'd like them to be general. You'd like them to have no error. You'd like them to be what I call realistic, i.e. the design reflects what you know about things. But it's very difficult to get all, all of those at once. It's easy to get one. Our field is usually defined by two of them. And they're hoping for a third. But almost nobody, okay, maybe Isaac Newton, gets four. Okay. So if you like, in a sense, um, one can see economic modelling as largely existing on this. They want their models to be fairly simple, they, they conceive of them as being fairly general, and they're aiming at that. Philosophy might be considered as it along this axis. You're not allowed counterexamples in philosophy. You say, ah, but what if you really are a brain in a vat and you didn't know it and your brain is wired? So, okay. So you're not allowed any of that. They would like it to be very general, so you're existing along this process, and they don't care about that one. They might like that one. Okay. Each field is, is a bit like that. Where's agent-based modeling? Um, it wants to be along this axis. Well, some of them would like to be on that axis, but I, I, I want to be on this axis. And what I'm aiming for is a bit of this one, if at all possible. That's my dream. Oops, let's go back. So you have these two kinds of simulation model. The abstract model, like uh, Axelrod, where you're, you're looking at an idea, where the distance, in a sense, to your object system is big, but you understand the model itself very well. It's a simple model. You can explore it extensively. You can analyze what's happening. You can do equations for it. You can prove things about it. But the mapping to, the, to what you're modeling is very weak. The sort of model I'm more involved in tends to be the opposite way around. So we have a much closer relationship to what's a particular example of what's happening. But the model becomes very complicated until it runs slowly and you still don't really understand what's happening inside the model. Okay. In that case, because each time we run the model we get a slightly different result, we don't fully understand the model. The infra step is weak. But to, for, for a good science, you need both relevance relating to what you're modeling and inference. So we're, we're a bit stuck. Uh, that reflects the difficulty of understanding social problems. It's, it's unavoidable. I'll, I'll now explain, one, I'll give you one example of this kind of model. Okay, and it was a model of social influence and water demand, and it was to investigate the possible impact of social influence on households and patterns of domestic water consumption. Um, it used a lot of inputs of various kinds, some real statistical data, some expert opinion, some things from uh, surveys, and some of the main characteristics of the output were the time series of the aggregate water demand in a, in a small district. So what did it, well, oh, sorry. Um, so the context was this project uh, to look at water demand under various different climate change scenarios. Okay, employed by DEFRA um, at the time. Um, and really, the most, the big part of this project was huge statistical models. Now, it was just a sort of add-on, as a critique of this. Okay, so not overplaying our 
uh, our role in this. Um, so those were our sort of purposes. Let's have a picture of how it like. So in this in this household, we had agents, which were the households, which interacted with each other. We had a policy agent, which was something like the government or a water water board. Sometimes gave you advice to use less water. There was a model of groundwater and real climate data that went into that. There were statistics about the activity, frequency, and volume of devices within the household, so how often people used washing machines and power showers and stuff like that. Okay, um, And really, it's the influence between households as to how much they use these devices. That is the real interaction in this model, and the output is how much water was used by this district. Now, in the size of the head of the agents, what did we do? We used an, appro an approach called endorsements. So inside the head of each agent was its observations of what its, its neighbours were doing, what the policy holder had told it, what its own habits were, what its... Um, yes, and what it wanted to use, really. And for every action it remembered someone else doing it, observed, it added an endorsement to where that action came from. It came from the neighbourhood. It was a recent action of my own, something I did. It came from uh, the policy agent, globally sourced. It was a new appliance, etc. So inside the agents, you had the sort of whole table of things that it observed and ideas in its head, using these sort of uh, tokens. And underlying that, there were the extent to which it cared about neighbourhood sourcing, what is what it thought of its own self-interest, and what it was advised to do by a policy agent. And in a sense, you can maybe simplify it to thinking there are three kinds of agents, but really they're a mixture of all of them. Okay, global ones, neighbourhood ones, and self-sourced. So, just to give you an example of uh, what's happening inside the head of an agent, this is res with respect to one action. It's doing one action. It's used that action, and so it remembers itself as self-sourced, because I've, I've done it in a sort of habit form. Month two, it remembers it as a recent action, but it also saw a neighbourhood using it, one of its neighbours doing the same thing, etc. Until eventually, that action is replaced by a new action. Why was it replaced? Well, it saw neighbours doing it, but it also saw the neighbour that was most alike itself doing it. Now, the idea of this, this scheme is not as ambitious as a cognitive model, but it's supposed to be something you can actually trace. You can see why the agent made the decision. You can trace it through and thus compare it against people's opinions about whether people would do that or not. Okay? So, in a sense, this model of very simple cognition is designed to be as criticizable by non-experts as possible. And people go further than this. They make it more easy to read than this. Sort of make it almost into a story, a narrative output of the model. And the narrative output is one of the things that can be checked against opinion, as well as the, 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 num the numbers. So here's a picture of all the, all some of the, some of the households in this neighbourhood and who influenced who. Uh, just as categorised people into globally based, locally based, self based. Uh, neighbours and who is copying who in uh, that neighbourhood. It tends to be just slightly different each run. Um, and here's some example results. Okay, I'll explain this graph. Demand is always 100 at January 73, and it went to, ja to January 97. Each of these coloured runs is a different run of the same simulation. So it's the same simulation run, I can't remember, 12 times. Okay. And that's how much water they all used in total. These dotted lines are the two major droughts of the period, when uh, the uh, water authorities and the government put a lot of pressure on people to use less water. Okay. The black lines are the introduction of new appliances. So I think, I think that black line is the introduction of water-saving washing machines, and that black line is the introduction of power showers. I always get these two lines much higher. I've got them the wrong way around. Okay. Uh, people can remember when they first could buy one of these things, they could tell me. Now, 
What is, what is interesting? Well, during a drought, everyone uses less water, fine. But after a big change, it doesn't necessarily mean sometimes they use a lot less water, but sometimes the opposite happens, they use more water. Okay. What happens in the model was that self-sustaining patterns of usage happen each time you run it. So each, each neighbourhood generated its own sort of mini-culture of water usage by copying what each other did and reinforcing each other's actions in the model. And so we concluded that, in fact, we would get very different patterns from each neighbourhood. And that actually turned out to be the case. When you actually, they actually measure from each neighbourhood the patterns of how much water they use, they don't follow the same pattern. They, they, they produce all these different sorts of patterns. Okay. So that allowed us to give a definite critique to these simulation models, which assumed that roughly everyone was doing the same thing with a bit of random noise. Okay, Because that wasn't what was happening. So it allowed us to critique some of the assumptions in the, in, the, in the statistical model from a stronger standpoint than if we just said so. Uh, and it established a possibility. It showed that it was possible that processes of mutual social influence could create self-reinforcing patterns of water usage. And it opened that model to criticism. So. These water, the representatives and experts from all the water companies came and looked at these models and would criticise it. Okay, now, they weren't very interested. They were only really interested in how many, how many reservoirs they had to build and not be blamed. Okay, that's really what they were interested in. They weren't really interested in much more. But they sort of engaged a little bit okay, and told us, oh, we wouldn't expect this behaviour. That's unrealistic and things like that, which, which went into the model building. <coughs> OK, so what we have here is not really a theory. It's more like a dynamic description. It integrates these various different streams of evidence into one picture, one computational description. It's a dynamic picture, but it's one picture. And that allows for experimentation, exploration of possible outcomes. OK, so it's not aimed as being a general theory of anything. It's aimed at being a specific description. One of the main benefits, one of the main outputs, was that it often raised new questions and issues that you wouldn't have thought, so, thought about unless you had a simulation like that. Okay. Uh, the simulation was slow and complex, so we couldn't say we fully understood it. And ideally, we should have subjected that complex simulation to further modelling and checking to try and understand our model. We think we understood our model, but we can't be sure. Okay. There are enough things happening between all these agents that it's quite difficult to understand in general terms what was happening in it. I have a brief one-slide advert for our SCID project, which Social Complexity of Immigration Diversity, where we're going to try this approach. So we're going to try and integrate micro-level evidence and macro-level data in descriptive simulations like this, and then physicists we'll try and abstract from that model to more simple models. So we hope to get both the relevance and the rigour by this combination of building up a chain of models. Okay. So we're, we're, we're in the process of version naught at that at the moment. We can't tell you how easy it's going to be to do this bit. <laughs> um, so we don't know. Okay, so conclusion, I think, about time, yes. Comparing natural and discursive approaches to computer simulation approaches, what are, what are the benefits? Natural language is rich, semantic, meaningful, flexible, but imprecise. So everyone interprets natural language things slightly in their own terms. The map to what's observed is complex and often implicit, i.e. we do it unconsciously. We're not fully aware of how our language of the things relates to things. And often when new terms are invented, dare I say social capital, there's this big process that comes out afterwards of trying to deconstruct this. And everyone's got their own view of what it should be and how it works and where it goes. And it's very difficult to keep track of complicated interactions and outcomes because you lose track. It has pre-prepared meaning and reference, which is good and it's also bad because it influences you. 
Computer simulation is precise, well-defined. Replicable, it's fairly flexible, but it's brittle. Semantically very thin. Um, you can make the map to what's observed more explicit and direct. Good at keeping complicated interact track of computations. Uh, and if it's going to be meaningful, you have to go through this iterative process of trying it again and going back and forwards to uh, experts before you can start attributing meaning to it. Let's compare analytical versus simulation processes. So analytical modeling is precise, very brittle. It's not semantic at all. The map to what's observed can be very indirect and difficult to establish. Though the inference inside it is very strong and checkable. And it produces general, uh, general characterizations of its outcomes, but it requires these heroically strong assumptions to work in most social, social cases. Okay. Computer simulation is the opposite. So inference is more contingent. Every time you run this simulation, you might get a slightly different outcome. And so you run it lots of times, you still might not know what the general shape. You run it for the thousandth time, and something completely different might happen from the first 999 times. You can never be sure. But one of the things I like about it, it can be related more easily to a broader range of evidence. So one of the, my pet projects is trying to develop ways of translating from narrative accounts and qualitative social science into the rules that would be used to produce these agents in the simulation. So that's a natural translation. People do make causal stories about what they do. Oh, I drew this and I do this, and if that doesn't work, I do this. That's the sort of thing that can be put into these models, as well as running it and checking against numbers. So these type of models are natural things for integrating qualitative aspects and quantitative aspects in the same model. So that's one of the things I'm very interested in. What can it do? OK, it doesn't do everything. It complements other, te other techniques in social science but it can allow the production and examination of sets of possible complicated processes in a precise and replicable way. Okay? It can avoid the strong assumptions that analytical approaches make and allows for lots of experimentation. One way I like to, to, to explain it is the biological distinction in vitro, which is in the test tube, in vivo, which is in life. Okay, they do lots of experiments in vitro about all your new drug or enzymes, and they just they, they learn from that. They do learn things about it, but they don't pretend to themselves that that's what's going to happen in the cell, because all sorts of other things can happen in the cell. But it still helps understanding and distinguishing some of the processes. So we can do the same here by actually saying, okay, it does help understanding processes, but you can't confuse that with the, what happens in the world. Because that's the step that lots of people make. And they can understand why they make it. They've played with their own model and they're convinced by it. And they go out and they see the world in terms of this, terms of this model. And that's how it works. Uh, and they're just, you know, you, you could appreciate their enthusiasm while stamping down their conclusions. I think is, is this the way you could deal with it. <laughs> Where would you learn more? Okay, just a few bits. There's a good book written by a professor of sociology and a computer scientist who's done agent-based social simulation uh, called Simulation for the Social Scientist. It's relatively well written and accessible. Key journal is this journal that's online, freely accessible, Journal of Artificial Societies and Social Simulation. There's an association. The best one is the European one. Okay, much better than the North American one or the Pacific Association one. Okay, and why? Because in Europe, EU seventh framework projects have brought together a disparate bunch of people from across Europe in, in these projects. And European social simulation has a far more descriptive, rich feel about it compared to North American simulation. So it tends to be far more reductive. You can see the cultural influences coming into play. And the distinction between European style social simulation and North American style simulation is quite stark. Okay. So European, there's, for example, a whole strand of people doing participatory simulation, where you really involve the participants in the construction of your model. So they go to a village, they play a game with the villagers all day on a board, they spend all night programming, and they present it to the villagers the next day. And they do that for five or six days. They come out exhausted, but happy, 
apparently. Um, but they've really produced, worked with the villagers themselves to produce a model of this, which can be part of, say, a process for determining land, mutual decision about who's going to get what water, water rights and stuff like that. Okay, so it goes the whole stream to, to the very participatory approaches. This language, if you want to try it, is the simplest. It's very powerful, but it's relatively simple and accessible. It's got a good, good documentation and good library of example models. So if you want to try it, you can get it free from there. This model, this book has examples of it in this. That's a bit helpful. All of these are on the methods slides.